Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 265. Today's big Bible question, what is the most accurate short description of a Christian? Hint, it's not too blessed to be stressed. So happy Thursday, friends. Now, I need to start off with a very important public service announcement, which I know is not normal, but I feel like the situation at hand is so important that it warrants an exception. As you probably know, ignorance of the law is not an excuse. And in the spirit of forewarned being forearmed, I need to let you know of a crime that I have never heard of, which is a surprise because I really did go to criminal justice graduate school. I was training to be an FBI agent when I got called into ministry. I'm still now very much into true crime and mysteries, fiction and nonfiction, and this crime caught me by surprise. I could have been sentenced to jail for over a decade for committing this, and you could have too. And neither of us probably would even know that this was illegal. So I'm trying to save you some hard time in jail today by telling you that uh, just today or yesterday, Alaskan dentist Seth Lookhart was sentenced to 10 years in jail, actually 12 years in jail, so over a decade, for operating on a patient while on a hoverboard. Now, when I shared this earlier with a pastor, a friend of mine, he asked a very important and insightful question. Was the patient on the hoverboard or the dentist? And that's actually a very good question, Pastor David. And it turns out it was the dentist on the hoverboard. The patient was unconscious. So the good doctor was sentenced to 12 years in jail, not making this up, for that and other, quote, unlawful dental acts. Now, I'm scared enough of lawful dental acts. I can't imagine what unlawful dental acts entail. So, point being... Do not operate on somebody while on a hoverboard. Now, even if you're a surgeon and you're thinking, well, that really only applies to dentists, I'm probably good to operate on my patient while I'm on a hoverboard. Just, you know, maybe look up the law on that just to be sure. But if you're, especially if you're a dentist or maybe even a dental hygienist, uh, don't uh, work on people while you are currently on a hoverboard. Um, that just sailed, saved you probably a lot of jail time, and you'll thank me later. Well, today's Bible readings include 2 Samuel 13, Psalm 65 and 66, Ezekiel 20, and 2 Corinthians 6. We have talked quite a bit before about how First and Second Samuel and Judges 2 uh, are books absolutely loaded with violence and crimes and assaults and all sorts of horrid and fascinating and terrible things. But honestly, today takes the cake. It's really just awful what happens in this passage. Terrible. Phoebe, who is my uh, nine-year-old daughter who listens to this podcast, maybe skip this chapter. You don't want to listen to it. I don't want you to listen to it. So just skip on past when we read Second Samuel chapter 9. By the way, Me saying all this is not a critique of the Bible, and I'm not trying to be funny, of course. This is just an acknowledgement that the Bible gives a very accurate, disturbing, and authentic view of humanity and depravity. The terrible things that happen in 2 Samuel are sin and evidence of separation from God and ignoring his commands and following one's own heart which is exactly what Amnon does when he rapes his sister. These are warning narratives. Look, I I am a subscriber to Disney+, Plus, but it seems like every stinking episode of a Disney TV show, the whole point of it is follow your own heart, follow your own way, be yourself. Hey, you know what? Terrible things happen when we ignore the commands of God and go after what we want and follow the impulses of our heart. Eh, something to think about. Thankfully, we're not going to focus on 2 Samuel today, but 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians, for my money, is probably the most underrated book in the Bible, I think. It is absolutely filled to the brim with powerful truths, deep wisdom, and encouraging spiritual treasures. It's also accurate to real life and not at all a bunch of fluff. I talk about Christian sunshine pumpers from time to time, and uh, I'm mainly thinking about like pastor Christian sunshine pumpers. Being a Christian sunshine pumper is far worse than a dishonest used car salesman. If you encounter a dishonest salesman, honestly, the worst that can happen to you usually is that you end up with a lemon car and a lot less money. That's bad. You don't want that. 
But far worse is to buy into a completely false and cheerily happy description of Christianity and then start living it and you're like, wait a minute, this is not what I was sold. There are people that have built huge ministries and churches and media empires by promising blessing upon blessing, health, wealth, and prosperity to boot. Look, I believe that God heals. I believe in the gift of healing. I believe miracles still happen. And I believe the Western church misses out on miracles and healing so often because of little faith and unbiblical theology. I believe that God does bless people on earth and in heaven who follow his ways and live by his commands. And I believe that nobody could actually read the teachings of Jesus Paul in the New Testament and come away with a rosy, hunky-dory, quote, too blessed to be stressed, too anointed to be disappointed, health and wealth, prosperity view of life as a Christian. No way. We are promised tribulation, trials, trouble, and pain. And if uh, the Christians you really like and listen to are not telling you that, along with hope and joy in the Lord, you know, find a Bible-believing group of people that says both of those things. Because the fact of the matter is, the best people in the New Testament, those closest to God, did not skate past trials and tribulations while the scum buckets fell into it. The best and godliest sometimes suffered the worst. That is authentic Christianity. Following Jesus is filled with troubles on this earth. Following Jesus is blessed by eternal rewards, too amazing to even comprehend. Both those statements are true. And yes, there are times of great blessing in this life too. I pray, believe, and stand on passages like Psalms 27, 13, which says, I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Yes and amen. I want that for me. I want it for you. I want it for my family. But his goodness sometimes means trials and suffering. And those trials and sufferings are a gift from God producing good things in our lives even when we can't see them. Following God on earth is wrought with deep peace and comfort and soul-rending trials and tribulations and glorious hope of the return of the King and life everlasting with Him in a place of no death, suffering, or sorrow. And that is why I believe that the best and most authentic and accurate short description of the Christian life is found in our passage today in 2 Corinthians. So let's read it and let's see if you can pick it out somehow. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 1 in the English Standard Version, because that's where I learned this passage. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold. Now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and not yet killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We've spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Your heart is wide open. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Did you catch it? Maybe I emphasized it just a little bit. Second Corinthians 6. 6, 10, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Brothers and sisters, this is what it means to be a Christian. 
It is sorrowful for a time, but we are always rejoicing in the past goodness of God, the present goodness of God, and the future goodness of God. I cannot think of a short sentence, four words there, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, that better captures the real essence of following Jesus. Will there be sorrow? Yes, there will. It'll be full of sorrow. Will there be constant reason to rejoice so that we can always rejoice? You bet. Constantly, 100% of the time, we will always have something to rejoice in as followers of Jesus. So let's close with Spurgeon, who says, Joy is the normal condition of a believer. His proper state, his healthy state, is that of happiness and gladness. As I have often reminded you, it has become a Christian duty for believers to be glad. Rejoice in the Lord is a precept given to us over and over again in the Bible, and I believe that, broadly speaking, the general condition of God's people is one of joy. It's not a falsehood if we say, Happy art thou, O Israel. True Christians are to be the happiest people under heaven. They have many sorrows. But there is a text which says, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. I will venture to assert, says Spurgeon, that Christians at least always have matter for joy. They are never short of material out of which they may make melody unto the Lord. If they will, they may rejoice, for they have plenty of causes for joy. The Lord has done great things for them, and they ought to add, whereof we are glad. And as they have plenty of matter for joy, so they have ample motive for joy, for when we joy and rejoice, we glorify God. We prove the reality of our faith and we make our religion, Christianity, attractive to others. The joy of the Lord is our strength, our beauty, our charm. There are always reasons why a Christian should be happy. And as he has matter for joy and motive for joy, so he always has a measure of joy. He may seem to be overwhelmed with trouble, but his ship still floats. He may seem to run short of joy as the widow in Elijah's day ran short short of meal and oil, but there shall always be cake for him to eat, and a little oil shall still remain in the jar. His joy shall never utterly fail him. He shall always have a sufficient measure of hope to enable him to keep his lamp alight in the darkest night. Above and beyond all this, the Christian always has a remainder of joy, which shall be in his, his in due time. What he is not yet in his own hand, the joy he has not yet in his own hand, is in the pierced hand of Jesus, held there fast and safe against all comers, so that he may and always should sing, Glory to you for all the grace I have not tasted yet. Some people have little possession at present of joy, but they have a reversionary interest in a large estate, and it is so with us. We have a heritage of joy that as of yet we have not yet entered upon, but it is ours by an unbreakable covenant, and no one can break that sacred entail. So let us again take up the language of the hymn we sang at the beginning of the service, and I'm just now quoting to you now. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets before we reach the heavenly fields or walk the golden streets. I don't know that hymn, but it sure does sound good. And thank you, Brother Spurgeon, for sharing that with us. And buckle in, friends, because Second Samuel chapter 13, verse 1 is here. Some time passed, David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar, and David's son Amnon was infatuated with her. Amnon was frustrated to the point of making himself sick over his sister, half-sister, Tamar, because she was a virgin, but it seemed impossible to do anything to her. Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, a son of David's brother Shemia. Jonadab was a very shrewd man, and he asked Amnon, Why are you, the king's son, so miserable every morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon replied, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend you're sick. When your father comes to see you, say to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare a meal in my presence so I can watch and eat from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be sick. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my presence so I can eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace, please go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare a meal for him. Oh, come on, man. Sorry. 
Uh, verse 8, Then Tamar went to his house while Amnon was lying down. She took dough, kneaded it, made ke- cakes in his presence, and baked them. She brought the pan and set it down in front of him, but he refused to eat. Amnon said, Everyone leave me. And everyone left him. Bring the meal to the bedroom, Amnon told Tamar, so I can eat from your hand. Tamar took the cake she had made and went to her brother Amnon's bedroom. When she brought them to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come sleep with me, my sister. Don't, my brother, she cried. Don't disgrace me, for such a thing should never be done in Israel. Don't commit this outrage. Where could I ever go with my humiliation? And you, you would be like one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Please speak to the king, for he won't keep me from you. But he refused to listen to her, and because he was stronger than she was, he disgraced her by raping her. So Amnon hated Tamar with such intensity that the hatred he hated her her with was greater than the love he had loved her with. Get out of here, he said. No, she cried. Sending me away is much worse than the great wrong you've already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. Instead, he called to the servant who waited on him. Get this away from me. Throw her out and bolt the door behind her. Amnon's servant threw her out and bolted the door behind her. Now Tamar was wearing a long-sleeved robe because this is what the king's virgin daughters wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long-sleeved robe she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away crying out. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has your brother Amnon been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. So Tamar lived as a desolate woman in the house of her brother Absalom. When King David heard about all these things, he was furious. Absalom didn't say anything to Amnon, either good or bad, because he hated Amnon since he disgraced his sister Tamar. Two years later, Absalom's sheep shearers were at Baal Hazor near Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. Then he went to the king and said, Your servant has just hired sheep shearers. Will the king and his servants please come with your servant? The king replied to Absalom, No, my son, we should not all go, or we would be a burden to you. Although Absalom urged him, he wasn't willing to go, though he did bless him. If not, Absalom said, please let my brother Amnon go with us. The king asked him, why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him, so he sent Amnon and all the king's sons. Now Absalom commanded his young men, watch Amnon until he is in a good mood from the wine. When I order you to strike Amnon, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Am I not the one who has commanded you? Be strong and valiant. So Absalom's young men did to Amnon just as Absalom had commanded. Then all of the rest of the king's sons got up and each fled on his mule. While they are on their way, a report reached David. Absalom struck down all the king's sons. Not even one of them survived. In response, the king stood up, tore his clothes, and lay down on the ground, and all his servants stood by with their clothes torn. But Jonadab, son of David's brother Shemaiah, spoke up. My lord must not think that they have killed all the young men, the king's sons, because only Amnon is dead. In fact, Absalom has planned this ever since the day Amnon disgraced his his sister Tamar. So now, my lord the king, don't take seriously the report that says all the king's sons are dead, only Amnon is dead. Meanwhile, Absalom had fled. When the young man who was standing watch looked up, there were many people coming from the road west of him from the side of the mountain. Jonadab said to the king, Look, the king's sons have come. It's exactly like your servant said. Just as he finished speaking, the king's sons entered and wept loudly. Then the king and all his servants also wept very bitterly. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, son of Ahumad, king of Gesher. And David mourned for his son every day. After Absalom had fled to Geshur and had been there three years, King David longed to go to Absalom, for David had finished grieving over Amnon's death. Gracious. Psalm chapter 66, verse 1. Let the whole earth shout joyfully to God, singing about the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awe-inspiring are your works. Your enemies will cringe before you because of your great strength. The whole earth will worship you and sing praise to you. They will sing praise to your name. Selah. Come and see the wonders of God. His acts for humanity are awe-inspiring. He turned the sea into dry land and they crossed the river on foot. There we rejoiced in him. He rules forever by his might. He keeps his eye on the nations. The rebellious should not exalt themselves. Selah. 
Bless our God, you peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He keeps us alive and does not allow our feet to slip. For you, God, tested us. You refined us as silver is refined. You lured us into a trap. You placed burdens on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out to abundance. I will enter your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows that my lips promised and my mouth spoke during my distress. I will offer you fattened sheep as burnt offerings with the fragrant smoke of rams. I will sacrifice bulls with goats. Selah. Come and listen, all who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth, and praise was on my tongue. If I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. However, God has listened, for he has paid attention to the sound of my prayer. Blessed be God. He has not turned away my prayer or turned his faithful love for me. Psalm 67, verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us. Selah so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations rejoice and shout for joy, for you judge the peoples with fairness and lead the nations on earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has produced its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 20. In the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, some of Israel's elders came to inquire of the Lord, and they sat down in front of me. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak with the elders of Israel and tell them, This is what the Lord God says. Are you coming to inquire of me? As I live, I will not let you inquire of me. This is the declaration of the Lord God. Will you pass judgment against them? Will you pass judgment, son of man? Explain the detestable practices of their ancestors to them. Say to them, this is what the Lord God says. On the day I chose Israel, I swore an oath to the descendants of Jacob's house and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt. I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day, I swore to them that I would bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land I had searched out for them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most beautiful of all lands. I also said to them, throw away each of you your abhorrent things that you prize and do not despile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and were unwilling to listen to me. None of them threw away the abhorrent things that they prized and they did not abandon the idols of Egypt. So I considered pouring out my wrath on them, exhausting my anger against them within the land of Egypt. But I acted for the sake of my name so that I would not be profaned in the eyes of the nations they were living among in whose sight I had made myself known to Israel by bringing them out of Egypt. So I brought them out of the land of Egypt and led them into the wilderness. Then I gave them my statutes and explained my ordinances to them. The person who does them will live by them. I also gave them my Sabbaths to serve as a sign between me and them so that they would know that I am the Lord who consecrates them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not follow my statutes and they rejected my ordinances. The person who does them will live by them. They also completely profaned my Sabbath, so I considered pouring out my wrath on them in the wilderness to put an end to them. But I acted for the sake of my name, so that it would not be profaned in the eyes of the nations in whose sight I had brought them out. However, I swore to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land I had given them, the most beautiful of all lands, flowing with milk and honey, because they rejected my ordinances, profaned my Sabbaths, and did not follow my statutes. For their hearts went after their idols, yet I spared them from destruction and did not bring them to an end in the wilderness. Then I said to their children in the wilderness, Don't follow the statutes of your fathers, defile yourselves with their idols, or keep their ordinances. I am the Lord your God. Follow my statutes. Keep my ordinances and practice them. Keep my Sabbaths holy, and they will be a sign between me and you, so you may know that I am the Lord your God. But the children rebelled against me. They did not follow my statutes or carefully keep my ordinances. The person who does them will live by them. They also profaned my Sabbaths, so I considered pouring out my wrath on them and exhausting my anger against them in the wilderness, but I withheld my hand and acted for the sake of my name, so that it would not be profaned in the eyes of the nations in whose sight I brought them out. However, I swore to them in the wilderness that I would disperse them among the nations and scatter them among the countries, for they did not practice my ordinances, but rejected my statutes and profaned my Sabbaths, And their eyes were fixed on their father's idols. 
I also gave them statutes that were not good and ordinances they could not live by. When they sacrificed every firstborn in the fire, I defiled them through their gifts in order to devastate them so that they would know that I am the Lord. Therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel and tell them, this is what the Lord God says. In this way, also, your ancestors blasphemed me by committing treachery against me. When I brought them into the land that I swore to give them and they saw any high hill or leafy tree, they offered their sacrifices and presented their offensive offerings there. They also sent up their pleasing aromas and poured out their drink offerings there. So I asked them, what is this high place you are going to? And it is still called Bama today. Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the Lord God says. Are you defiling yourselves the way your ancestors did and prostituting yourselves with their abhorrent things? When you offer your gifts, sacrificing your children in the fire, you still continue to, to defile yourself with all your idols today. So should I let you inquire of me, house of Israel? As I live, this is the declaration of the Lord God. I will not let you inquire of me. When you say, let's be like the nations, like the clans of other countries serving wood and stone, what you have in mind will never happen. As I live, the declaration of the Lord God, I will reign over you with a strong hand and outstretched arm and outpoured wrath. I will bring you from the peoples and gather you from the countries where you were scattered with a strong hand and outstretched arm and outpoured wrath. I will lead you into the wilderness of the people and enter into judgment with you there face to face. Just as I entered into judgment with your ancestors in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you. This is the declaration of of the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge you of those who rebel and transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they live as foreign residents, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. As for you, house of Israel, this is what the Lord God says. Go and serve your idols, each of you. But afterward, you will surely listen to me and you will no longer defile my holy name with your gifts and idols. For on my holy mountain, Israel's high mountain, the declaration of the Lord God, there the entire house of Israel, all of them will serve me in the land. There I will accept them and will require your contributions and choicest gifts, all your holy offerings. When I bring you from the peoples and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered, I will accept you as a pleasing aroma and I will demonstrate my holiness through you in the sight of the nations. When I lead you into the land of Israel, the land I swore to give your ancestors, you will know that I am the Lord. There you will remember your ways and all your deeds by which you have defiled yourself, and you will loathe yourselves for all the evil things you have done. You will know that I am the Lord, house of Israel, when I have dealt with you for the sake of my name rather than according to your evil ways and corrupt acts. This is the declaration of the Lord God. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, face the south and preach against it. Prophesy against the forest land in the Negev, and say to the forest there, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says, I am about to ignite a fire in you and it will devour every green tree and every dry tree in you. The blazing flame will not be extinguished and every face from the south to the north will be scorched by it. Then all humanity will see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It will not be extinguished. Then I said, O Lord God, they are saying of me, isn't he just composing parables? Hmm. Lord, may we not be so slow to hear your word and follow. Good day to you, friends, and Godspeed.